Illinois. The name still has the highfalutin lilt left by the French voyageurs. Those who don't know pronounce it Illinois. But then there are a lot of tricky names here that people have trouble with. It's not Athens, it's Athens. And in Illinois, it's do you know the way to San Joe's? Or Marseilles? Or Cairo? They say the wife of the first mayor of this town just spun the globe and named it for the place her finger landed, Peking, China. She called it Pekin. Then there are the places named by Germans, nostalgic for Vienna or lonesome for their poets. In Germany, it's Goethe. But if you want a Chicago cabbie to take you there, he'll say Gothi. And don't tell him he's saying it wrong. He just might tell you to jump in a river. The Ambra, forever altered on the Illinois tongue. In the same way they named this state, these brash people shaped it. More than any other state, Illinois reveals the hand of man. is a place where he conquered the impenetrable prairie and invented skyscrapers. In other states, they may talk about the way the geography formed the people, but here the opposite is true. Some might have found it impossible. In Illinois, they carved out a state. The people who keep building Illinois are the people you'll meet next on Portrait of America. Illinois could almost have been two states, it's so long and gangly. A lot like that tall fellow Abe Lincoln from down around Springfield, the capital. Summers near Cairo are hot enough to grow cotton. Illinois dips further south of the Mason-Dixon line than Richmond, Virginia. Heading the other way, it lies further north than Cape Cod. And those harsh Lake Michigan winters can be colder than Juneau, Alaska's. Illinois is farms and cities. One city in particular, Chicago. It began as a mosquito-infested river mouth trading post named for the stinking wild onions that grew there. There, in that unlikely swamp, they created a city. Then they reversed the flow of the Chicago River and sent their swamp down to New Orleans. The Chicago fire leveled the city and gave Chicagoans a magnificent opportunity. It was a clean slate for architects like Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright's turn of the century design startled people with a radical new style. He called it the Prairie House. Chicago's architects gave the world more than just the beauty of their creations. They gave it buildings that scraped the sky. tallest building, the Sears Tower. It takes three elevators to reach the top. If you don't yawn, your ears will pop. More than a quarter of a mile high, the Sears Tower is the highest point in Illinois. The urge to reach up out of the prairie, to move the earth and shape it, goes back to Illinois' earliest inhabitants. They built huge earthen burial mounds, like the ones at Cahokia. Remnants of vast civilizations that flourished throughout the river valleys of Illinois. They're well aware of that just north of Cahokia, in a little farming community called Campsville. Here farmers plowing in the spring found evidence of more than a dozen civilizations. Archaeologists from Northwestern University organized a dig. Yeah, if you find something, dig around it. So you can get the features also. Now people from all walks of life, including kids, 
come here to unearth the past. As you've seen, what we're looking for... These are eighth graders from Peoria. They're digging for treasure. Fifteen hundred years ago, when this pot was made, Rome had just fallen. We got material we can use for a knife. At Campsville, kids learn by doing. Need me. When they leave here, they won't just have read and heard about Indians. For a brief time in their young lives, they will have been Indians. You've got to be able to compare us, our ancestors, with the predators, with their claws, with their fangs. Okay. Their guide is John White, an anthropologist who is part Indian himself. What we're doing is mixing the clay thoroughly in around the grass so it'll hold together. John White okay. can turn clay and straw grass, into walls. Hold it together till it dries. Okay. Now push it in with your fingertips. The walls become homes, like the ones that stood here 1,000 years ago. Inside, there is magic, too. In John White's hands, a stone becomes an arrowhead. And a branch becomes a shaft. See? That's how the point gets put in there. Okay? Then you can use this then for... There are lessons to be learned here that have little to do with just making arrows. Like when he rolls strips of basswood bark to make twine. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm just rolling these on my leg away from me. Okay, this is what's called a single ply cordage. Okay, but look, what's it doing? Okay, somebody way back in the past, maybe three million years ago, who knows, invented something. John White doubles the strands and rolls them again. What I just made was a two-ply cordage, okay? This won't unravel. Remember, the individual fibers are weak, easy to break. But when they're together, when they're working strong together, you can't ever break it. That's a rule. It's got to do with a lot more than making string. When we're studying the Through past, John White, remember, these kids see Illinois as the Indians did. This is the way Europeans first saw Illinois, by way of the Mississippi. For Père Marquette and the voyageurs, the river was the only road. They were forced to travel by water, because the prairie, both beautiful and astonishing, was a barrier. A man on horseback could be swallowed up in its tall grasses. The people who first tried to farm it soon failed. Those prairie grasses were too tough to plow. Their thick roots were like ropes binding the heavy soil. It took a sturdy band of immigrant Swedes to break the sod. Ron Nelson's people. The prairie was a tremendous obstacle to settlement, especially by individuals. And where there were large expanses of prairie, it was groups who eventually came in and settled. In 1846, Ron Nelson's ancestors came here to found Bishop Hill. It was a communal society. They shared work, property, and all profits. Only by working together did they succeed in breaking the prairie. The story of Bishop Hill is captured in a remarkable series of primitive paintings by Olaf Kranz. As an old man, a retired house painter, he put his boyhood memories of the colony on canvas, sometimes on flour sacks, whatever was available. It took groups of people, and that's what, why development here was retarded, because these people had to be organized and ready to confront the grass. The grass was a much tougher enemy than was the forest.
They worked in teams. They plowed together and planted together. They harvested together, and the colony flourished. The paintings of Olaf Kranz captured it all. The glare of the strict schoolmaster, the sad eyes of a divorcee, the squint of the man with the fastest horse in town. And he painted Bishop Hill exactly as it was in its heyday before the commune fell apart. Once the prairie was broken, they no longer needed one another. The colony was abandoned and might have been forgotten except for Ron Nelson. Because of him, his hometown lives. He used the paintings of Olaf Kranz as blueprints for buildings like the Colony Church. Well, I think this is my identity. I have worked on so much in Bishop Hill now. So I've actually done physical work, actually planned the work, that I feel like, you know, I have a stake in it almost as much as those people who put it up. And that's, I think it's good to be able to feel that way about something. Today, Bishop Hill is a mecca for tourists, especially Swedes who consider it their most important historical site outside Scandinavia. Sometimes, just for the fun of it, the folks of Bishop Hill show how they plowed in the old days. When they do, they get an understanding of how difficult it was for one man to cut through the prairie muck. I think this is keep you out of trouble at night. Yeah, <laughs> The iron and wood plows brought west by the pioneers just wouldn't work in the heavy, rich Illinois soil. The stuff clung to the blade, and the farmer had to stop and scrape it clean every few steps. All that changed here, when a determined blacksmith pounded out a solution. His name was John Deere. His self-polishing plow solved the problem. It sliced through the prairie sod and cleaned itself as it went. Soon a John Deere plow was on every prairie schooner headed west. Part of John Deere's legacy is a massive international company. Yet the real legacy of John Deere is more than the sleek and beautiful earth movers that bear his name. There were one quarter billion acres of prairie in the land that was still to become America. There was almost nothing between the Mississippi and the Rockies but prairie. John Deere changed that. His plow, more than any other thing, Open the West. John Deere's legacy is this breadbasket, Illinois.